This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Ooh. The Evoca boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, everybody. Now, that is my eye. And that is because today is the very special Monday. It is a Safari Lives. And we love Safari Lives. It's episode 54. And it's the day that us guides get to be a little bit more feminine and leave our hair down and look a bit nicer than you usually do. And it's a chance to catch up with all our characters, which is the most important thing, of course. And as well, we have a nice tent session, tent session, and we will be delving into the vision of many, many animals, as well as some eyes, literally. But I promise it'll be very not gory or ungory, but you are welcome to turn away if you feel that it's a bit too gory for you, but I will give you plenty of warning. And hopefully it'll be nice and neat. Surely does. It surely will be. But we are going to be speaking a lot about vision, like I said. And we're going to be talking particularly about some mammal vision, avian vision, as well as reptile vision, and with a few clips thrown in. Now, at the moment, I'm trying to figure out where I can slot in those dissections. So I'm thinking about, oh yes, I forgot about that. My name is Trishala. Hello. And Jandre is on camera with me this afternoon. I was so focused on my eyes and you know how much I like vision. And we've been speaking about it quite a bit. So it'd be really nice to delve into sort of the special little things, the intricacies of all of that. And what's really, really captures me about vision is the fact that all it is is light. It's just a matter of how that light gets converted into chemical signals and then gets sent to the brain of various animals. So us humans, we may only be able to have a range of about 380 nanometers to about 700 and a bit nanometers. And anything above that we call infrared and anything below that we call ultraviolet. And now you would be familiar with those terms because we use infrared cameras. And in fact, we would tonight as well on the vehicles that are out. So you'll be familiar with all of that. So we'll talk a bit more about which animals can see what, which animals can see infrared, which can see UV. Some animals can even see a polarized light. We'll talk about slits and the animal's pupil sizes, things like that, even the size of the actual bulb of the eye. And of course, the evolution of the eye. Very, very exciting things. So I might have to step into the tent now. Could it be time? But we're not definitely not going to, we're definitely not going to start the dissection now. I'll give you plenty of warning. I'm going to prep myself. So while I go along and do that, let me send you over to Lauren. Maybe she can show you her eye. I spy with my little eye. Let's see what we can find today. My name is Lauren and on camera today I have Craig. <laughs> so of course Trishala will be talking to you all about vision and a little update from this morning. I did remember to put my contact lenses in for today's drive. How, how do you forget to put lenses in? But don't worry, it's a very, very minor prescription. But when I didn't have them in, I felt, oh, but of course I, stand, I can still see. But yes, of course, it's much, much better for us that I have them in. So we are bumbling with no specific plan today other than to see what we encounter, what tracks we come across, who we bump into. Sometimes I really do feel that is the best way to go with everything. I've been very, very lucky lately with all my leopard encounters. So I'm hoping that my luck keeps up for today. So we checked the sort of dam cam area, Vuatella Dam, and then now we're just gonna check another water hole, Galago Pan, and just see if anybody's around having a drink as it is a very hot afternoon out here. Thank goodness for that. And very often when the sun is shining, of course, the animals do come down to drink. Oh, there's some lion tracks here. I think they're old. But anyway, so we're going to bumble on and it's not just me that's driving. I'm going to send you across to Tristan. Here 
Well, yes, Lauren, you are looking at old lion tracks and I'm looking at fairly recent lion tracks. It looks like for one of the Avoca boys, the one with the limp that he has at the moment. As Lauren mentioned, my name is Tristan and on camera I have David this afternoon and we're going to try and see if we can find these said lions. But before we do all of that, Lauren was talking about forgetting her contact lenses and Trish forgot something and so I'm going to make sure that I remind all of you that you need to be regular and that this is sponsored by Metamucil. Right, let's go on. Oh David, I've dropped something. Hold on, before we go anywhere. Otherwise I'm going to get shouted at by Jean-Dre. Let's not get shouted at by Jean-Dre. Look, David, it's the clip. Oh. Yes, one must not lose the clip for the mic pack because otherwise the cameraman shouts at you. So this little clip is very, very important. It attaches to said mic pack via two little metal things that bounce in there, and then that goes onto your belt, and that way you don't pull the mic pack out, well, the cable out of the mic pack. But I've gotten myself into a terrible tangle here, David. This is what happens when you go away for the weekend and you come back. You've got to remember how you do all these things. Right, now we're good to go. The track for this male is going down. It's the one that limps. Um, actually, I wanted to show you that before we actually go anywhere. Um, if you see it coming down here, you don't have to go in too far, Dave, because it's actually quite nice, a little bit further away. But there you can see his foot. And you see there in front, there's a break in the tire tread. Now that break there is where he's dragging his foot forward. So it's quite easy to see his track. And if you come forward a little bit to the next track, Dave, um, which is this one over here, um, you can see that track, no line in front. The tire tread is completely even in front of his toes. So three feet, you won't see that um, drag. It's only the one foot that drags like that. So that's why we know it's the Evoca. Um, there are lots of lines around this morning, apparently. So I want to see where these go. They're on top of all the vehicle tracks. They look fairly decent, but no one drove here today, so it's difficult to say if they are from this morning, from during the day, um, but it looks like they're pretty good, so we're going to try and see where they are. They go the opposite way, I know, um, as much as I'm... Um, as much as I kind of know which way they're going, I want to just loop around to Sydney's Dam just to double check if they haven't potentially just looped around and gone and drank there because apparently there was lines that crossed at Sydney's Dam and the Inkumas went that way. Now, I believe a lot of you are wondering if it's a concern that <coughs> the evokers are around with the Inkahuma male and the, and the Mangani male. Most definitely when it comes to those two, they're going to have a tough time of it, I'm afraid. Um, as much as you want to sugarcoat it, the evokers are not going to tolerate those two boys much longer. And as those manes are starting to develop, their size is getting bigger, and they're going to start thinking, hang on a second, this is now competition, and particularly because we very seldom see all three of the evokers here. It's mostly just two, and that's a two against two scenario, which is not ideal. So, um, you will try and figure out, um, you know, if they can sort of see that these guys are a threat, then they're going to push them away as quick as possible in order to take over. Right, let's see if we can find these lines. In the meantime, I'm going to send you across to Trishala, who's actually going to get us underway and see how, let's get the pun, and see what we can learn about eyes. So, let's get straight into it, and what better way to get straight into it than with this critter right here. It's our prince, Hassana. It's a lovely, lovely shot of him and you get a clear look at his eyes. So, let's start with a little bit about eyes. Firstly, us as humans, we are what's called tetrachromatic, which means we can see three basic wavelengths or see up to certain basic wavelengths and we see color with our cones and we detect light with our rods. Now, rods are, as you would think, tall, when they're sitting at the back of your on your retina, they're tall, whereas the cones are much shorter. Now, the cones detect color, as I told you. So it's not particularly important to have many, many cones for an animal like Hosanna. Hosanna has dichromatic vision. So that means that he can't actually tell if something is red. It's almost as if he's colorblind, if you know people who are colorblind. So they find it hard to differentiate reds. And in fact, most animals can't see red and we are a bit of an exception. Let's chat a little bit about that because this is, talks a lot about the history of the eye and the way the eye developed. Almost all mammals have this dry chromatic vision because it was not necessary for them to invest in more than that because we don't actually have fancy colors 
on us, do we? So we always have sort of these muted colors because we only have one pigment. So it wouldn't make sense for us to be able to recognize red pigment if we can't actually produce it. But studies have found that the ability to have this red pigment, however it had come about, or this red ability to detect a red pigment, allowed us to proliferate because it meant that we could now seek out red berries, red fruits, and most importantly, fresh red newly grown leaves that seemed to be the best diet for primates at least around that time. So primates do have trichromatic vision, but let's chat a little bit about Hosanna's vision. So here, before we even play our clip, we're going to just have a look at Hosanna's eyes. Now, his eyes actually, you can sort of see two almost three layers. So there's obviously the black, the pupil, and that is what lets in light and tells or Hosanna's eyes use to adjust how much light it wants to let in. Then there's the outside, which is that orange bit there. That's the iris, and that is basically the sort of area that the muscles are in for it to contract and release in order to open and close that pupil area. And then if you look carefully, there's a slight sort of change in color there. And that is because the iris is the visible part, but underneath that, or rather, underneath this area here is what we call the ciliary body. And that is the actual muscle that pulls against the pupil and pulls it apart. So you will also notice that Hasana's pupils are round. And they're round even though your house cat's pupils are not round because they're slit. But we'll talk more about that where it's a vertical slit when we go and talk about the wild cat. But for now, let's chat about Hasana and his round pupils. Why on earth would he have round pupils when most other cats have slit pupils? Well, that's because he's bigger than most cats. So the vertical slit seems to be associated with animals that hunt close to the ground. Whereas big cats like Hosanna and tigers, leopards, lions, all of those, they actually don't hunt close to the ground and they need to let in as much light as possible. So let's play and at least watch this lovely, lovely boy. Oh, look at him. Stunning. So now you can also see that he's got these whiskers just above his eyes. It almost looks like eyebrows. And that's because the those are sensory organs as well. Those are macro vibraci. Oh, you started right at the top. Okay. So those ones on the eyebrows, those are macro vibraci. So he's using that as a sense as well. And he's also got the micro vibraci at the bottom right here. Tom, you'd like to know if leopard cubs when they're born have a different type of vision and whether they grow into a different vision or as they as they they grow i suppose they don't add or reduce the amount of cone cells or rods in their eyes so theoretically they shouldn't have a difficulty with vision but what they may have difficulty with is the color of their eye so if you have lighter color eyes you're going to have a harder time dealing with the light so people that have blue eyes green eyes in fact anything that's not brown eyes is going to have a tough time with light but that's a really, really interesting question because you know that many cubs, especially lion cubs, are born with blue eyes. And that's because it's almost as if they haven't had a chance to or they don't really want to be out in the light. So it's best to just keep them sh covered in a way. And that's why they are a lot often in dens because all that light can actually hurt their eyes, which is interesting, I think. But I was telling you a little bit about the actual structure of the eye and what Hasana sees when he goes through the bush. So what he sees, he can, by the way, dilate his pupil to almost 135 times its smallest amount, whereas we can't dilate our pupils to even close to that, not even, probably a quarter even less of how many times he can dilate his pupils. And that's because he hunts at night. So he needs to let in as much light as possible. And he mostly sees stuff in sort of pale, washed out, gray scale kind of way. But it's most effective for him because he doesn't need to see reds because he's not busy picking fruit or flowers for his girlfriend. So his vision is best suited for him and it applies the same for lions and for tigers. Like I said, the big cats. Now, before I move on uh, to the other clips and the other types of vision that we get, 
let's talk a little bit about how the eye even came about. So we had little, little tiny cells, and I say we as in everything that's ever lived that has eyes, that can now see, have little, little tiny cells. And what they were, they were just receptors of light. So it just gave an indication of something is light, something is dark. Something's light, something's dark. Then it becomes a collection. Then that collection becomes a line. You have a line, and then light hits it and now you're getting more information from those photoreceptors then that line curves just a little bit and then you get a pit and then now as that pit starts to be conceived and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you end up with an eyeball that gives light direction or it gives us the ability to determine direction of light because of the fact that it's going in and bouncing going in and bouncing so you can understand how that's happened and you'll notice that lots of animals still retain primitive eyes for example a dragonfly or many insects they'll have their two compound eyes and they also have two or three ocelli on the tops of their heads and those are very 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 simple eyes that only detect light so it lets them know if it's if it's if they're moving towards the sky they're moving towards the ground so it can it's very very simple but it's very very effective and it's evolved multiple times across multiple groups not sharing the same ancestor all have the same need to be able to see anyway we'll chat about our next clip in a bit let me send you over to Tristan the leopard whisperer himself I think it's going to be a fascinating afternoon as Trishala delves into the world of eyes and brings up all the little facts that there are. And it's going to be very interesting to see what she comes up with. As you can see, we've used our eyes, David and I, to see miles into the future and the distance to be able to spot these elephants that are, well, on the border of Manuleti and Buffel's Hook at this stage. They are so far away. Um, you can see a few birds fluttering about, but they really are miles away at the moment. Looks like a really nice herd, though. Um, they stretched quite far across. It looks like a couple of bulls in there, some females with their little ones, and everybody's just generally taking it very slow and very easy at the moment. I don't know if they've been to the dam because they seem like they're coming out from behind the dam wall rather than actually coming from the dam side going up into the vegetation. So I was just having a little look around just to see if maybe, just maybe, they were going to turn a little bit and come more towards us. The problem is, is from where they are now, if they head northwards, there's actually a pump dam that's not too far away um, at a place called Jacobin. And so that's maybe why they're heading up the hill rather than back towards where we are. Now, these guys' eyesight um, is pretty good. It's probably very similar to what ours is in terms of um, depth perception and, and kind of, well, not depth perception, maybe not because they don't have as binocular vision as what we do, but in terms of how far they can see and, and tones of color that they can see. Um, and I'm sure Trishala will get into all the various animals that we do get out here, but their eyesight is pretty good. Um, elephants will pick up movement around them pretty quickly, um, and they often liken their eyesight to ours, except, like I say, with depth perception or judging of distance, because unlike us, um, they don't have the binocular vision. David? There's some guinea fowl alarm calling behind us. Hang on a second. It's not that time of the year for guineas to be mates. Why are you making noise, guinea fowl? What have you found? I can see you. What have you seen? Have you seen my lions that I'm looking for? Or are you just being noisy? I've, my reversing skills are on point. Thank you, Emma. Actually, funny enough, saw my parents this weekend. And um, this morning, we had to reverse out of the place that we were staying. And I must admit, it was probably the longest reversing session I have ever seen in my life. I don't know why my dad just couldn't get the reversing right and was, for some reason, going all over the place, which... If you've driven a, a vehicle for a lot of the time, like we do, you know, reversing can become second nature, particularly these cars that don't have mirrors. You learn very quickly how to be able to do it. But, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> felt like just stopping the car and saying, let me do it rather. David, we're about to be attacked. Look what's running at us down the road. Oh, there goes the squirrel to meet them head on. 
look, David, the squirrel's running at the guinea fowl. The guinea fowl have all stopped. They've said, that's it. I'm not going any further. Crazy squirrel inbound from the left. And so that just halted everyone's progress. But there was running straight at us. I, it was a stampede of guinea fowl coming towards us. Luckily, we survived, David. If it wasn't for the squirrel, we would have been dead. Phew. Dangerous stuff to be out here. Anyway, we're going to scratch around. These guineas are making a bit of noise, so I wonder if maybe something's lying up in these quarries. In the meantime, let's send you back across to Lauren and see how she's getting on. I'm so happy Tristan is back. Well, I haven't had any luck as such, but we did, we did check the two water points and nobody was obviously thirsty but we are on our way to another one which is treehouse and i believe this is where hosanna was last seen don't quite know where but i do feel it's definitely worth coming down here and checking it out see who is around treehouse in my opinion is one of the better water holes as the water appears much cleaner and less stagnant than the others and it's fuller so of course Talking of Hosanna, I think every one of us here has had a fantastic sighting with him this week and spent much time with them. So let's go and review exactly the time spent. Bye. Contrary to his youthfully pink tinted nose, Hosanna's overall physique and physicality has matured since he took his sabbatical. However, the young leopard still needs to hone his skills when it comes to hunting. Statistics are not in Hosanna's favor, with only a small percentage of leopard hunts resulting in successful kills. However, the seasonal shifts and earlier setting sun favor our spotted cats and play into their skill set allowing them to put their great eyesight and incredible stealth to work. Although a valiant effort, it seemed that this attempt was yet another failed endeavor. But there was no time to slink away and sulk in solitude, as a weary hyena, having heard the impala's barks, came to investigate. The hyena looked almost as disappointed at the lack of dinner scraps as Hosanna seemed with himself. With futile attempts to convince his unwelcoming guest of the effort he went through to only come up empty-handed, Hosanna was finally left to wallow in peace. We're at the water hole. Let's check out the Impala if we were just drinking. Now, of course, Hosanna Cat does make failed attempts at hunting and we do, of course, tease them about that. But let me assure you, it is completely natural. Leopards have so many failed attempts. Even the most experienced hunters like Hukamuri and Tingana, who have got years and experience on their side. Now, for the Kruger National Park, it is said that 16% of a tip, well, hunts result, result in success, only 16. And within the study that they did, 61 out of 64 attempted hunts failed in the Kruger during daylight hours. Now that's a really, really high percentage, especially, well, it is during daylight hours, of course, but they are better in the nighttime because they can use the cover of darkness, but that's a pretty high number that result in failure. And that is just the way it is for leopards. It's not easy. They really do have to get the timing right, the conditions right. They have to camouflage themselves and of course ambush the predator. And I think that study also said that 57% of all sort of kills that are stashed in the trees have scavengers present. So even if a leopard does make a kill, as you know, there's always someone out there trying to steal it, namely lions, other leopards, or hyenas. So 57% of all hoisted kills had scavengers present. And of course, our impalas here are a little bit nervous because it's drinking time. They're never too keen to come to water points. We have a bachelor herd here of five boys that I can see. <sighs> 
look how nervous they get. They're very, very cautious around the waterhole. So impalas also have excellent eyesight. And if you look at the impala's eye compared to the size of its head, it's rather large. And that's a big indication that they have really good eyesight. Even although they are diurnal animals, they can see incredibly well in the dark. And just the direct proportion of eyes to the sort of shape of the head shows you that it's good eyesight. Firefly is asking what happened with Tingana and Hosanna interaction during the week. Well, they just interacted as they always do. And it was over a python, believe it or not. Now, when we initially first came across the sighting, we weren't sure if Tingana had killed the python or not. We saw where the python had been killed and it was sort of directly around the throat. He had a big injury, but we we had no idea. And there's a lot of speculation that the python was killed by a honey badger, but there's actually no proof of that. There was only a dead python and some honey badger tracks, I believe. So absolutely possible. Oh, <laughs> something scared him. Absolutely possible it could have been a honey badger, but I don't think there's any guarantee or proof that it actually was. So somehow Tanganas came across this python and of course taken it for himself. Then Hosanna got wind of it somehow, probably through his nostrils. And Tingana and Hosanna are known for following each other around. One thing I must tell you was yesterday I followed Hosanna all afternoon during the live drive. And he was, of course, urinating and defecating in various spots, which I witnessed because he was right in front of me. Then... We bumped Tingana, luckily, during our SABC show, and it was incredible to watch him. He followed Hosanna's every step, sniffing at all the patches Hosanna had urinated, because I remember, and, of course, sniffing his poop. He was following his son. So I do have a suspicion they follow each other. They know each other's scent, they know each other's roots and paths, and they do follow each other to see if they can steal. So Hosanna was obviously trying to get a bit python from his father, but indeed, it did not work. I think he came in and of course Tangana did his usual, usual growling and snarling, but it was really not overly aggressive. It was more like, this is my python. And it has been an interesting week. I think some of you are mentioning that. It really has indeed. The Tingana sighting was quite a surprise for me. So we are going to continue bumbling forward and see what we can see. And of course, it's time to go back to the tent with Trishala. Look at our furry friend. Is he not absolutely adorable? Because I think he is. And I'm actually not 100% sure what it is, but I actually think it's not a caterpillar. It looks like a... a a beetle larvae almost. I think that's what it is. I don't even have my insect book with me, but it's very, very cute, don't you think? Oh, I wish it would show us his eyes. Well, when he does, I'll make sure Jean-Dre goes back to it. But let's get back to our eyes and let's have a look at what the prey relationship is like in terms of differences with eyes because it's very, very distinct. So. It's almost as if herbivores have a certain type of eye that is a horizontal pupil, whereas carnivores have the big round eye or the horizontal slit. Now, it's very, very, very basic, but in general, eyes can fit into either one of those groups. So, let's have a look here. Now, before we start, I'll just... Oh, furry friend, I'm sorry. Walked over the mouse cable just as I moved it. <laughs> ah, hello! He lifted up his head for us. Anyway, Hasana is in this clip, is kind of just lying down and he's not doing... This is my co-host. Emma says it's my co-host. It is my co-host providing all the relevant entertain entertainment while I just gas on about science. He's the fun one. Anyway, <laughs> this is Hasana and we're going to watch this clip because like I said, we want to talk about 
predatory kind of eyes, which we did in the prey eyes. So here we're going to see an interaction between Hosanna and some wildebeest, as well as some impala. And then after that, we'll get a close, nice look at wildebeest eyes. So let's have a look here at him at the moment. There he is. Sitting comfortably, and you can see that he is quite hidden in this bush. And the wildebeest and the impala, obviously now they've seen him, but they would have noticed that something was behind that bush or something like that, because their vision is so extensive that they almost have a 360 degree view of him or of the environment. So they can see him clearly. Even now when he's, when he's there, just sitting down, they don't seem to worry about him, but we know that's why. It's because they've noticed him, they've seen him, and we know that his style is, of course, not to rush up and run onto something, but to ambush something. And so the animals know that if they alarm and they let him know that he's been seen, he's basically lost his advantage of being able to ambush. But how do they do that? So we saw what it allows them to do. I just want to now open up that wildebeest one and we can have a look in a bit. We just discuss it for a little while. So we can have a look at the wildebeest eyes. We touched on it previously, and you would have noticed that even goats have these sort of horizontally shaped eyes, and wildebeest, much the same. But not all have simply rectangular pupils, per se. So what they may have is a rounded pupil that's just been flattened out horizontally a little bit so it's still round and you'll notice that with impala and waterbuck things like that which are also herbivores and need to have that almost 360 degree vision they tend to have that so it's not just a strict line it really is just a circle that's been pressed out horizontally so let's have a look here I am going to pause it when we get a good look off the at the eye and you'll notice that herbivores have a very interesting structure in the muscles of their eye which is actually not expected this is something that was recently discovered but something that people who have horses might have noticed ah uh, here comes our part oh no just when you pick the eye there we go so you would have noticed that perhaps if you have a horse or maybe you didn't notice because scientists didn't notice for a very very long time but when you have a horse and the horse puts its head down to eat and the horse will also have a horizontal pupil it rolls its eyes in the opposite direction to its head when it goes down so this is the eyes of a horse as I put my head down to feed my eyes actually rotate in my socket how insane is that so that means that even when they're looking down and they're eating they can still get a clear view of the horizon in front of them what more would you like? I mean, if you are a, a prey item and that's what you, that's the worst thing that can happen to you is be eaten by something, that is the best defense. You constantly have eyes out and you always live in herds, or most of the time at least, so that you can all be looking out at the same time. But what that doesn't offer them is depth perception, at least not very much. There are certain instances when you might get depth perception, uh, depth perception but most of the time they can't actually th see so they all look looks like in, in 2d instead of 3d depth perception you said something that I forgot for this minute but I'll do a little jig for you in the meantime That's oh it's fascinating yes it is fascinating all these things that's why I like eyes and vision so much because it truly is fascinating now these herbivores these herbivores are also dichromatic and they owe this dichromacy. We hear stuff rustling behind us. They owe this di dichromacy to the fact that when mammals evolved from sort of shrew like beings or shrew like animals during the Jurassic period, or not during the Jurassic, but during the Cretaceous and Triassic, when dinosaurs were kind of all involved together and they were all proliferated all over the, the world. And then about 65 million years ago, that's when big meteor strike in, in Mexico or 
presumably, and had caused the death of the big land-dwelling dinosaurs. But what it allowed was the mammals, which were just these small shoe-like things, to come out and be in the light. So before that, when they were living alongside dinosaurs, it was not there. It was not an advantage to be out in the in the daytime because you could get smashed. Literally, <laughs> you could get taken, eaten. It was just not a good environment for you. So, we or mammals, early mammals, actually stayed in caves during the day in burrows, and then they were mostly nocturnal. Hence, they lost a third sort of color cone because reptiles generally have four color cones. So, all that sort of owed to that, to the fact that we are nocturnal when it began, which I thought was really, really interesting. So this is what this wildebeest has to, I suppose, owes the vision to him, to its ancestors, but that vision, unfortunately, was best suited to the nighttime. Now, wildebeest and many other herbivores also have the typical tapetum lucidum to look in the night. Cenac, you'd like to know what type of vision primates have? Primates have trichromatic vision, so they can see three Frequency. So the highest frequency on each cone is three different types. So you can see basically green, blue, and red, and combinations of those. And like we said, that is because they need to be able to see red fruit. And that was the theory, is they needed to be able to see red fruit, red leaves. And it actually became an advantage, because now they're eating better. Animals that, see, that have that extra cone, that for red, are eating better, because they can see juicier red things. And then those, excuse me, those genes get pushed forward. It's very interesting stuff, the way that it all kind of comes about, and we spoke, or I think we touched on it when we were at the hyena den a little bit, about primates' vision and the ability to actually get these sort of fruits and things. But then more than that, it meant that we were more conscious, or we could easily see subtle signs in the expressions of the people that lived together with us. And it then led to larger social bonds, or greater social bonds, it just spirals out of control and then on to, after that you kind of like oh well now you can notice when somebody is being deceitful because they can see something in their face and the whole thing just spirals out of control very 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 cool so it does offer them this vert this horizontal pupil does offer them this really nice field of view which is what they need and their muscles are pulling their eyes opposite way to their head when they're putting their face down amazing I think. Anyway, let me send you over to Tristan and we'll move on to our next eye type in a bit. Well, luckily, Trisha's eyesight must be good because she's a fairly social creature. Um, that, I suppose maybe not very good then, actually, if we think about it. Still not. Because most social no, creatures' better. eyesight, while it's good, is not the best that is out there. Anyway, um, lion tracks that we're following have gone towards Aubrey's Road, which is encouraging. It means that they're not going out of the property. Uh, they look like they're coming in. The problem is, is I don't know, nobody can tell me if they've seen lions over the last little bit, has there been any tracks on this road? Was there any males roaring from the side? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions, really. And I honestly don't know how fresh they are. I, I, all I know is that there's only one set of bird tracks on top. Now, normally when you track um, big cats, it's one of the first things you look for is bird tracks on top of the foot because that, you know, then means that the lions were walking at night. Um, but these are on top of all impalas, all birds, um, bar one set. So I wonder if it wasn't maybe during the day today he walked uh, early this morning and no one kind of drove there, so they didn't even realize that he was on here. I know there was some males that were seen at Simambili and then they apparently reported to have crossed into Manuleti, but um, I'm not sure if that is the case. The tracks certainly look very good. Um, so what I'm doing is I've come around to Aubrey's. The track should come out just in front here somewhere. I'm just trying to work out exactly where I am. Um, but there's a really nice game path that comes out and it should just pop out on that game path and we should be able to see them. If they don't come out here, then we know that he's possibly still inside this block, which would be quite nice to find him. Doesn't look like he's with his friend, um, his fellow coalition members. Looks like he's on his own. Um, walking around so I'm just going very slowly in case he just came straight across this is roughly the area where he should theoretically pop out there's I'm just trying to find the game path it should be right in front of me somewhere here 
Inkahumas use it every now and then. Not often, but they do, and Shadulu used to use it quite a bit. Um, so just checking very, very slowly. Also, just in case he is lying up somewhere here, um, you never know, maybe we miss him and drive right past him. A sleepy lion sometimes is an easy thing to miss in late afternoon lights, especially in winter when all the grass is so kind of downtrodden and dead. <sighs> David? is not coming out right now where i am at the moment is a good area to check because often you get random random things that rock up here and earlier in the week we actually had a very random sighting here now my voice won't be attached to the clip because well, i wasn't here and so stephen had to voice it but it was exciting nonetheless Early in the week heralded a wonderful surprise as an unknown male and female cheetah materialized onto Juma from the south. Possibly brother and sister, these two cheetah, not yet fully grown, have spent the last few weeks roaming the southern and central sections of the Savi Sands. The pair stumbled onto the open clearings of quarantine, an ideal open habitat teeming with impala prey. We hoped they would remain with us for some time. However, with the high density of large cats frequenting Joom of late, it is no surprise that the pair found the air rank with the smells of lion and leopard. Opting to keep to the more open clearings, this young cheetah pair moved further north, keeping ever vigilant for any sign of predator and prey alike. Well, how exciting was that? A very, very random surprise to have had two cheetah. What was even more interesting is that that afternoon when we had those two cheetah, the guys told me that they had tracks for another two cheetah to the south of us on Hoffman. So it seemed as though there were four different cheetahs walking around. And then there was also the young female that was from that thorny bush female that we saw a year ago um, that was around two. So there was five different cheetah in the same sort of period that was hanging around the northern Sabi Sands, which is pretty cool. Now, those two cheetah, we don't really know where they come from. There's no real history on them, and so difficult to say. Now, this is the game path that I was talking about. You can see here where it goes and actually this is a game path that Trish crossed the other day but this lion has walked straight across the road here so very difficult to see his track and I was saying earlier you've got to be a bit careful so if you look it's a bit tricky Dave I think it's a bit close but he goes straight across this section and then his next track is in the middle by that little clump of grass there um, yep there you can just see it to the bottom right of the screen and he goes straight over there and into this bush towards Gallego Pan. So I'm just going to follow these and see. Um, I mean, they look fairly good. So we're going to try and figure out if we can find this fella. Um, the good news is that he's heading deeper into Juma rather than further away. And so what I need to find out, David, did you see the Inkahumas this morning? Negative. Negative. David did not see the Inkahumas this morning, which means that it's going to be very tricky to find out whether or not there was a male accompanying them this morning because I have a sneaky suspicion that this male maybe had followed all the noise of the Inkahumas shouting. So where would this come out now? This is going to come out on Vuyatela Access, but that's going to be a bit tricky because Vuyatela Access actually looks like two males now that it's crossed over. Um, so Vuyatela Access is going to be, so many cars have driven there that it's going to be a bit tricky to figure out where they came out. What I'm thinking is they might have turned more towards Gallego. If they haven't come out here, then we'll have to take a little bit of a walk on those tracks. But it's most certainly the same track that came from the other side. So we're just going to shoot around and see if we can find it. Unfortunately, with lions being around like this, our cheetah won't stick around long. And they wouldn't have spent that much time here. And because it's so open in parts north of us and south of us, I suspect that the cheetah was spending a lot more time in those areas, and when we do get sightings, it will just be transient movement from one side to another. Now, you might be wondering why we would see two young cheetah in this area out of nowhere. Well, what's happened is it's obviously they've left their mother, either forcibly or um, it's just time for them to have gone, or their mother has died, and they um, have then now become what is basically nomadic. Cheetah siblings will often be like that, and they're still quite young, and so once they get to a point where the female starts to come into an estrus, um, then you're gonna see them moving on. 
So, Sean, you're wondering if they are the offspring from the... I think that's what you said, Emma, uh, of the mother that passed through Juma that died. No, they are not. So everybody keeps confusing them. They most certainly are not the same. There's alarm calls here, David. So Franklin is upset. Why are you upset, Franklin? See any birds of prey? Can you hear it? That is an alarm call for a Franklin. Now I'm trying to scan all the trees to see if there's not a bird of prey before we even go there because I don't see any sign of a predator. There's no tracks crossing the road. There goes a squirrel. Could be a slender mongoose. Slender mongoose also will set off a Franklin like this. Um, let's just take a little loop in there, David, because whatever is irritating this Franklin, you see the Franklin is up on the tree. You see it? Yeah. Ah, nice. So I wasn't even looking at my screen. I was too busy trying to check around here, but something has definitely caused that Franklin to be very, very upset. And don't be alarmed if it makes a whole racket now as I drive here and goes da -da 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 something like that. Um, because as I go past, I might make a bit of a noise. There's a little Steenbok. Why are you shouting at the Steenbok? Maybe it got a fright with the little Steenbok that's lying down. There goes the Steenbok. You can see it bounding away. And it's just stopped now. Rosemary, you say the Franklin is definitely trying to tell us something, but there's a Steenbok right here. Why, oh why? Would a Franklin be upset about a steerwalk? It makes no sense whatsoever. Hmm. David? Franklin? What is going on? Why are you upset? What made you angry? I suspect maybe it was a little slender mongoose that's caused this ruckus because there's another two Franklins that are down on the ground. But listen to this for two seconds. <laughs> Very cool. All right, now that we've listened to it and we've established that there's not really anything that I can see, let's send you across to Lauren because she's going to be exploring Chitwa Dam. very shouty. Well, unfortunately, it sounds like Lauren is struggling a little bit with the audio, so you're back with us and our shouting Franklin. I wish our Franklin was struggling with its audio because it's making a lot of noise and no reward for us, David. Very, very upsetting. Right, um, where am I tracking to? We need to head a little bit further down the road. Um, at first I thought maybe, just maybe, there's a little leopard that's just hiding down. Sometimes a, a cat like Columba would cause that kind of thing to happen, um, where it would be just sitting there because the Franklin has seen it. And so I was excited because maybe, just maybe, we were going to get a view of a, of a Franklin or of a leopard. But yeah, I don't know what's caused it. I suspect, like I say, a dwarf mongoose with that steering box sitting right there like that. I highly, highly doubt that there was any sort of predator in the close vicinity. Steenbok are very alert and very aware of what's going on. So we did look around and there was also another two Franklins down on the ground. So I suspect it was just that Franklin kind of came out at that right time and caused that issue. So maybe that's why. Anyway, move on. We'll try to see if we can find where this lion went. Just bumbling very slowly down Vertel Access because ultimately this lion, if he has crossed, I'm going to have to be very, 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 very diligent about my tracking because um, so many cars drive on this road that it's it's very tricky to see if a lion crosses, particularly if it does what it did there when we saw it just now, where it just goes straight across. Almost impossible um, to to be able to see that track. So. 
We're just going incredibly slowly, just checking all the places that I know um, cats come out of this block. Uh, there's a pathway that's going to come and it's going to intersect with us fairly shortly. And so we'll check it there. Even though this impala is in front, it's not to say that he hasn't popped out somewhere from this general vicinity. So it should come somewhere here. David, I don't know where that path is now. I think it's a little bit further out on. There we go. Impala's running in the golden light. Right, now it sounds like Lauren has sorted out her contact lenses, sorted out her audio, and so now we can actually send you across to her and see what she's got. I am back. No idea what happened there, but I am back and we are on our way to Chitwa. It's starting to approach golden hour and of course Chitwa Dam is a permanent guaranteed clean water source for many animals. So I'm just going to pop and see what happens. We did have three battaliers earlier perched in a tree. I'm not sure if you saw them or not, but I hope you did because it was rather adorable just seeing the three of them perched up there. And of course, most of the raptors have fantastic eyesight. Nowhere near as sharp as the vultures. Of course, their eyesight is absolutely incredible. Oh, Emma's saying you did get some view of the battalier. Thank goodness for that. So yes, vultures' eyes are absolutely incredible and some of the vulture species rely heavily on their eyesight. They're able to see so far, even the smallest of animals running around the ground. So of course, the theme of this Safari Lives is eyes and the person whose eyes we've spoke about most this week is of course, Hukumori. I had the most fantastic encounter with them. So let's go and see what happened. With such an undeniable swagger, Hukumuri seemed unusually cautious when we found him on his territorial patrol. Obviously thinking about breakfast, he came face to face with a male in Pala. The Duke's rival was weary, not launching into his usual charging style. It was quickly revealed that these precautions could be attributed to his limited vision sporting quite the battle scar. In true Captain Hook style, an eye patch would be completely on brand with his namesake, a true test to his villainesque character. The question is, will he make a full recovery and continue his quest to conquer the throne? suit an eye patch a really cool funky eye patch to help that eye of his heal and of course the name captain hook suits him perfectly captain hook the hook so we're almost at the dam i'm just going to quickly go up onto this wall and give you a beautiful view of chitwa dam where it's never quiet it's never inactive it's always full of life on some level so I'm just going to pull around here. Oh, look at that. Just as the sun's starting to go down, this view is incredible. Let's take a look. Pasa's asking, do we have any updates on Hukumori since then? I'm just getting my binos out so I can also scan. I don't know. I really don't. And we have tried to look for him because, of course, we do know the sort of routes that he does take. And I would really, really, really love for one of us to find him just to see what that eye is looking like. Does it look the same? Does it look any different? Is it swollen? Oh, look at that. Big fat croc staring at two water buck bum. So yes, I would really love to bump into the hook and I really want an update. So I know it's on everybody's mind. So on a daily basis, I think at least one of us is trying to locate him. There was big male leopard tracks. At some point, I'm just looking, the saddle both storks are incoming. Yes, Craig spotted them as well. <laughs> Our domestic couple, husband and wife right here. Is it male and female? Oh, <laughs> this is courtship. He's still courting. He's flapping his wings like this, picking up twigs. Oh, and you can hear the fish eagle. 
I can't actually see it, but I heard it. So yeah, sorry, just to wrap up, as soon as we get any updates on Hokumura, you actually will be the first to know, all of you. And hopefully we can spot him soon. So this pair of lovebirds here seem to be doing courtship rituals every single time we come down here. The male keeps flamboyantly opening his wings. He's regularly putting twigs and all sorts of things in his mouth to impress the ladies. So I'm just going to stay here a little bit longer, have a scan around, because there's always something happening at Chitwa. And of course, Trish has got a lot more information to give you in the tent. I am, and I've got my gloves on, and you know what that means. So before we show you the eyes, so we can discuss Hokomori's little problem, first, before we get into this, Especially, remember, if that you are sensitive to this type of thing and you don't want to see them, you're welcome to just listen if you want. Just turn us, turn away and listen to me if you want. And we're going to discuss Hokumuri's eye before we get into the eye. But, so, Hokumuri looks like he has what's called a, a laceration on the cornea, so a corneal laceration that is different from a corneal abrasion. A corneal abrasion is something you might get um, if you are working someone you didn't wear goggles and something hits your eye that type of thing something impales your eye or sort of creates such a slit that it actually goes in through to your lens that can be very very problematic and i don't know obviously i don't know what happened to hukumori's eye and obviously i won't be able to tell what the potential is for him to have sight again but the way that it looks he looks like he has lacerated her, his cornea to the point where... Oh, hello, everybody. We have some guests, yeah? Let's just say hello to them quickly. <laughs> hello, guys. Did you smell eyes and come along? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> okay, well, you guys can hang out in the background of my dissection. But anyway, back to Hukumuri's eye. He, that blackness in it is kind of blood and vitreous fluid that's in his eye that has become loose now because it's not in its proper chambers and that's why you're getting that horrible kind of black misty look in his eye now if it is a deep corneal laceration then his ability to gain his sight is pretty slim um if it's if it's shallower and it manages to not get his whole sort of lens or get into the lens then he should be able to, to recover Animals are amazing things, and you'll find that they can actually recover pretty quickly from a lot of things. In fact, even from an injury to the lens, there are many fish and amphibians that can regenerate their own lens. It's amazing stuff. Even a chicken can generate its own lens, but only when it's an embryo. So if there's an issue in development, it can also regenerate its lens. Okay, time has come. We're going to dissect this eye. <laughs> And it's, it's like they all came and they heard me when I said it's time to dissect the eye. They all came out and said, ooh, that's what we've been waiting for. <laughs> they they are not a horror movie, Emma. They just want to watch. They just want to watch. And you can see that they're licking the bones that are outside here on, at the tent. Oh, that's sweet. Oh, that's so sweet. Hello. And that's their way of sort of supplementing their diet with a bit of calcium. Anyway, stop distracting me, guys. Let's get to it. So here are the eyes. There are two eyes. First here, obviously, give me a break. I had to work with what I had. So there's no lion or kudu or anything like that. That's eyes. So we have here a pig's eye. And here we have a chicken's eye. There's some differences in them. That's why I have two different ones. We're going to look at the chicken's eye a bit later when we talk about bird sight. But we're going to look at this mammal eye for now. So all of this around here is connective tissue. You see that? It's just connective tissue. Underneath here, you have muscles. And then there's a strong bit here. And I can feel it as I put my hand over it. And that is the optic nerve. So let's take away some of this connective tissue so we can have a good look at the eye. Oops. One thing I particularly don't like is having gloves that are, don't fit you. I need to, to get more gloves. 
I, I always thought I had big hands, but apparently not. Jandre, don't laugh at me. Everyone watching in FC, don't laugh at me. You know I have, I am a big person, okay? I was just saying to Jandre that. <laughs> ah, ewes and cool, that's what I'm getting, ewes and cool. Don't worry, it'll get a lot cooler and hopefully a lot less ew. So everyone will be happy. I just want to get rid of as much of this connective tissue. Oak tree, you'd like to know if lion pupils have a larger depth of field or longer depth of field. Uh, they may be to a point to a certain degree, as a literal degree, maybe a few degrees more, but uh, basically forward-facing fo forward binocular vision is pretty much all equal when it comes to field of view and depth perception. Now, when I say binocular vision, that is having eyes on the front. I'm not going to use my fingers to point at my eyes, but having eyes in front of your head so that you can look forward and you don't have to invest in eyes on the side of your head that will only give you this 2D image. So when you only have a 2D image, you can't actually tell how close something is because everything is 2D. You can't see it in reference to something else. So that's why having that binocular vision and that depth of field is so valuable, especially for something that's hunting. Mm, guys are still around. That's nice. Okay, so this outer bit and what you see in your eye, that's your white outer bit, is called the sclera and it's basically a really tough pit that holds your eye. That holds, that is the structure of the eye is all held together by the sclera and that's the sclera there around the eye. So we're going to cut through now, brace yourself because there's going to be some liquid and the liquid that comes out is going to be called vitreous humor. Oh, this might be a better job for a scalpel. Just a neat fact or a neat thing to remember. When you put your, when you're cutting with a scalpel, you've got to be very careful and make sure that you have back of the blade against your palm and then you're over. So this blade can't slip. So let's cut nice in here. You'd be surprised. You think that things can just cut easily. But the fact is the human body and many cells are very, very tough, very tough. And sometimes you can find it very difficult to cut certain parts of an animal. Get our forceps out, which is the correct term. Some people call them tweezers, but we call them forceps. I'm going to cut it completely in half, and then we'll have a look at our two halves. Now, this eye is not a particularly fresh one, so you may not, you may not see very, very clearly. Oh, come on, come on. Says no, I need your scalpel, miss. Okay. Sorry, Jandre, I'm just going to put you out of the shot for a second. Ah, some of you are saying you were not, you didn't actually realize how layered an eye is. An eye is very layered. There's lots of things going on. There's different layers, and even in that sclera that we'll chat about in a bit. But I've finally gotten through this and. It's so tough, a sclera is so tough that it's difficult for me to even cut through it with blades and scissors. But we're getting there now and you can see that that liquid is starting to come out. That is the vitreous humor and it is very, very, oh, my lens came out too. Now, it's always easier to do this with an eye that's been kept in formalin or some sort of preservative because things get hard when they're kept in that kind of way. And when things are hard, it's a lot easier to work with. Okay, let's start with this. So inside here, that is your vitreous humor. And in here, we have our lens. Come on, come on. There you go. Now, because obviously this animal has died about a couple days ago, this is this lens is not very stiff, but it's not particularly, it, it is stiffer than this in general. And what I find is that when you cut open a lens or you even squish a lens, there's sort of a really hard middle bit. <laughs> it kind of looks like an onion because it's layered. And towards the edges, 
it gets a little bit more jelly-like. So here, it's obviously already started to basically be fraught. Now, I'm going to cut this open. We can talk about the lens in a bit. But you'll notice that lens are pretty much the same sizes everywhere, or the same kind of shape. It's the pupil, the thing that's allowing light through, that can be cause the variation. Okay, so if you can come in a little closer here, Jean-André. Are you standing back for a reason, Jean-André? Uh, closer <laughs> if I'm further. Oh, is that what you mean? So I just wanted to show you the thickness of the sclera. So the whites of your eye that look very sensitive and soft, that is thick, very thick and tough. Now this blackness in here, that is called the choroid, and that area is where the sort of the melanin sits, the dark pigment in your eye sits there, and it serves to absorb light that is normally scattered and can also give you the red eye effect. So when you have a, uh, if your eyes have been dilated the whole time and you suddenly get a flash of the camera, your eye doesn't have time, your eye doesn't have time to contract its pupil quick enough. So then you are actually seeing the reflection of the blood vessels behind your eye and that the choroid is trying to do its best to absorb as much light as possible. Now I want to show you the actual retina So you see that here, there's a creamy... <laughs> Connie Bayou, I think jean is on his way out. <laughs> you said you could be waiting for the cameraman to pass out. Fair. Okay, so here we have an area here. Can you see it's a little bit lighter? Just that thing I'm scooping up there. That is basically your retina. Because it's fraught, you can't see it very well, but it's usually pushed against that back of the eye. Yeah, that's right. So it's pushed against the back of that eye and it's pushed together by the vitreous humor. That's the liquid on the inside, the gooey stuff. Now there's also an aqueous humor, which is sort of in the anterior chamber. So there's two chambers. The anterior chamber is between your, your cornea and your lens. And then between your lens and the back of your eye is the the posterior chamber. So we have our retina, we take that out. Now there's also an area in your eye, if you can imagine, that the eye actually, there's nerves all over that are collecting those, or cells all over that are collecting that information. And then those, oops, there we go, put that there. Um, I was not sure what I was saying. But I was talking about cells or something uh, along those lines and just realized that this eye is very fraught and I was not happy with it. <laughs> but we can still work with it and I'm sure I'll get back to it in a bit. Okay, I'm going to show you these last two things and then I can send you over to Lauren. Oh, blind spots, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> that was it, blind spot, give me a minute and I'll just finish up here very quickly. So a blind spot, if you imagine all those photosensitive cells are pushed up against the back of your retina and for them to pass through, pass uh, in order to pass through to the nerve, there has to be a spot where that those cells could all come in. And at that point, you can't see anything and that is your blind spot. And we might be able to see it here. No, ah, here it is. That there is the blind spot. And that's where the retina all attaches through that hole and it comes out here at the optic nerve. And very quickly here is the front of the eye and we have the pupil out here. Then we have the ciliary body which is the area that contracts and kind of moves the actual iris. And there's also suspensory, suspensory little muscles that hold on to that iris and the iris even though all of that is the same color and may look the same those are the muscles and that iris is this thinner black bit right here that's the part you see from the outside anyway that is a basic dissection very basic dissection of an eye and of course our lovely very fraught lens you've disappointed me lens 
I'll see what I can salvage. Anyway, let me send you over to Lauren because she has two lovely, lazy crocodiles. Well, we do have two lovely, lazy crocodiles, but something has just caught Craig and I's attention and it is rather hilarious. We do have... Gin <laughs> Here we go. The guinea fowl are one by one launching themselves over the dam to the other side. They're just doing it one by one and they're taking little runs. Look, this one's gonna go. Oh. It's just been going on for a few minutes now, launching. Oh, there we go. Take off. <laughs> It's very adorable. It's just literally been bouncing back and forth. All of them are making their way to the other side by taking this little run and then leaping into the air. It's rather entertaining. There's still more of them. I think one's going to take a run very shortly. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> He's like, no, don't leave without me. Oh, adorable. Is that them all? It is. I think they're safely on the other side now. So, yes, we do have some very lazy, adorable crocodiles who are juveniles. And crocodiles are about 30 centimetres long when they're first born, about 12 inches. And they grow about 30 centimetres per year after that. So I would imagine these two are just approaching the year mark. 30 centimetres plus 30 centimetres, so about 24 inches here. Just as a guesstimate... Oh, Stork, you're walking rather close there. He's like, meh, I'm not bothered. They're just juveniles. And I'm sure Trishala is going to tell you all about crocodiles because they do have unique eyesight. And they are, of course, primar meh, primarily nocturnal animals, which means that they're adapted for the dark and the night time. So their eyes will, of course, accommodate that so that they have improved vision during the night. And they also have a special tapetum lucidum, which is this reflective layer we regularly refer to when we're talking about the predators, sharks also have it, as well as Hosanna, as well as Tingana and the Inkahumas. So it's not just limited to mammals, but I am sure Trishala is going to tell you all about crocodiles' eyes, so I won't go too much into it. But these juveniles are very well camouflaged. You can, they kind of look like a log from far away. So they're obviously just resting here, disguising themselves on the sand. There's another one there, you see that? This one looks slightly larger marginally larger but they are of course also juveniles around here very very cute crocodiles i am a big fan of crocodiles a big fan of reptiles yes actually i think as chris said the saddlebill stork really shows the size of the crocs actually you're right i didn't even think of that the tallest stork of course makes the crocodiles look absolutely tiny but do not think that these crocs are not going to get any bigger because they will grow incredibly large they're slow to grow but once they actually sort of get a little bit older they will become huge huge reptiles and probably continue to do the exact same thing which is lie on the banks of the dam and not do very much but you should never underestimate them because when crocodiles want to move fast they really can on land they look a bit clumsy they of course have clawed feet at the front and webbed feet at the back to help them give them traction on land but also for swimming through the water so they're designed for both environments but when you do see them walk on land it's not the most elegant thing shall we say and of course they can't sustain their oh. hippos what is happening <laughs> Oh, the Chippewa Dam is never quiet. Yes, Emma's saying they're attention seekers. Yes, they are. They obviously want me to be talking about them. But today, of course, I've just decided to talk about the crocs because I personally find these juveniles really, really cute. But other than the hippos and the crocs, Chippewa Dam is a little bit quiet today. So I feel there's still more areas that I need to explore. 
So we're going to continue on and see exactly who or what we can find. So Trishala has washed her hands, thank goodness for that, and she's finished her dissection and ready to give you more information. I have cleaned my hands, all clean, but now it smells horribly like disinfected, but still very clean and all good. And I hope that it wasn't too, too horrible for everybody. I don't know if I should feel bad that I like that sort of thing. Not that I like that. Never mind, digging yourself in a hole, Trishala. <laughs> but I do very much like enjoy in, enjoying investigating that kind of thing and seeing for yourself, you know? Why not? But now we're going to move on to the other type of predator eye, and that is the vertical slit eye. And you notice this one from your cats, your household cats, and us with our wild cats, even any other small cats besides our big tigers, leopards, and lions really all pretty much have that slit pupil. Now, that slit pupil also is something that's quite common in, in many, many reptiles. And it seems as if that slit pupil has something to do with the hunting strategy of animals. So let's have a look at the wild cat doing its thing. It gives us a really nice look at its eye. Now, this was Tristan's sighting, and it was just so, we were so lucky to be able to actually watch it. Look at that as it goes through. Now there's those big eyes. So those eyes are actually, oh, there we go. Better, better. So these eyes are actually fully, you can see how much light it's collecting. All that light in the back of its eye. Now we weren't lucky enough to have an animal that had a tapetum lucidum that we could look at, which would have been awesome. Oh, Mr. Wildcat, just you hang on. Just you hang on. There we go. So I just wanted, I wanted to just show you very quickly that its, its face is, and its eyes are fully dilated and it's collecting a lot of light. That is the most important thing. But also, it's vertical slit, but you can't really tell when it's fully open. The pupil is fully open, which is kind of cool because it also means that they can, they have good vision in both types of environments. Now, they are dichromatic, which means that they obviously can't see color very, very well, like we've explained, but that vertical slit allows them to collect less light from the sides of them. So with a horizontal slit, it meant that the animal had, could collect less light from the top and the bottom that would distract them and rather more light from the sides so they could see the view of predators around them. Whereas with predators, they would like to narrow in, zone in on something that they want to catch. And that's why they have these vertical slits. So these vertical slits are associated with animals that are close down to the ground and whose hunting strategy, strategy seems to be ambush hunting. Now, the way that this works is that the animal creates a, what's called a defocus blur. So if you can imagine, you have blurry objects on the side and you have these clear objects in front of you. So you and your brain does a bit of trig and it can actually calculate the distance between the blurry objects and the sharp objects that are in focus. And that's why the animal needs this vertical slit because it helps them better detect distance, which is super important, especially if you're low on the ground and you want to be really, really cryptic and quiet and you want to move through silently, you need to be able to see what's in front of you really, really well. I think it's pretty cool. Anyway, the wild cat shares that kind of eye with the many, many creatures, like I said. So crocodiles have a similar type of eye, but we'll discuss crocodiles in a bit. Snakes as well. So snakes have the vertical slits, but you'll also notice that snakes that are usually in trees don't have that type of um, pupil. They would have a round pupil. So it has a lot to do with distance off the ground, which I find interesting. So obviously, the fact that that's there's that vertical slit, must somehow be able to block out all that noise that they're getting from being close down on the ground, because that is a lot. You're getting the grass right up in your face, you're getting the soil right up in your face, tree stumps, all of that stuff. So that, I suppose, is also a way to get rid of that noise and be able to zone in on your target, which is exactly what these predators want to do, because they're ambush predators. Now, apart from them, there are a few other animals that have vertical slits, but they usually are 
reptilian or, of course, predatory, usually cats, of course. Anyway, we are going to maybe, I wouldn't mind if Emma is so obliging, to have a look at the crocodile one quickly, just because they have a similar type of slit. What do you think, Emma? What does she think? What does she think? <laughs> Thank you, Emma. She's so obliging. She really is. Anyway, so here we are. We have our crocodile. This is either Boris or his friend was Vlad. Yes, we're not sure who. But you can see that as it cruises down, the eyes are on the top of the head. So here we go. The position of the eyes, much like the amphibious hippo, means that it can keep most of its body underneath while the rest of its eyes are sitting on, or the eyes are sitting on top, even though some, most of the body is covered. Look at that, you can barely tell that it is actually <laughs> underwater, or, or it, something is there because it looks so ridiculous, it's so well camouflaged. Now, crocodiles have a really interesting thing as well. Obviously, they've got the vertical slits, so same type of ambush technique that we know that they use, but they have something really special. Now, many animals have what's called a fovea, which is basically a tight collection of, of cells in your retina where you get the highest resolution. For us, it's called a macula, and that's where we get the best picture. For a crocodile, now, usually this is one spot in the eye. For a crocodile, they have one that's a lion. So their fovea is a lion. So that means that when they're sitting like this, with their heads down low, their horizon is always sharp because their greatest resolution is being used in a horizontal platform to watch the horizon. So really, really, really good tactic. And we know that they ambush, so it would make sense. But that is it for vertical slits. And soon, or after this, we'll chat about some birds and their phobias also, which is very interesting. Anyway, let me send you over to Tristan and see what he's up to. Maybe it has something to do with the horizon, and I will do another dissection when we get back. Indeed, we are watching a beautiful horizon as the sun sets slowly over Mariepskorp at the moment, and the Drakensbergs, the northern side of the Drakensbergs, very, very pretty. There's a lot of dust in the air, and so that's why we've got that kind of pinky purplish coloration that's coming through. Now, the reason why we're sitting here and um, listening out, and the reason, and I say sitting because at the moment I have my feet up on the dashboard, is because I was tracking the mail lines, as you can see. This is the way to relax when one is doing this. I was tracking the mail lines, and um, they walked to where it looks like the Inkahumas were this morning. And then from there, it just was a mess of tracks, and I actually couldn't see roughly where they went but their general direction was kind of eastwards into into the into the area um, and then it was also getting too dark and I was saying to David I had that s weird feeling when something was watching you and I don't like that feeling especially when tracking the two evoker males and on top of it when it's starting to get dark so I thought it's best not to do that but then we heard roaring and so I heard roaring from somewhere this side and so I had my feet up watching the sunset, talking to David, in hoping that they would roar again, which they haven't. I don't know, David. What can one do other than throw their hands into the air and just be like, come lions, roar at me. Make, make noise. Of course, they're going to roar right now, David, and they're going to roar inside here, and I can't see anything. Now, earlier we were chatting about these evokers, and obviously it means quite a little, quite, a lot for the Inkuhuma pride, but so far it seems as though our Mangan male and our Inkuhuma male have managed to stick it out and well we were graced with their presence last week. Bye. During the day, lions for the most part remain rather inactive, preferring to sleep away the day's heat. Come nightfall, a change usually comes over these big cats as the temperature drops and the light with it. The young males were the first to move for a change, proudly showing off their size and developing manes. Not quite finished dozing, the lionesses watched the boys walk off before pushing the snooze button for an extra couple minutes of rest. How nice was it to see them, and yes, it is strange that they were so good given 
time of the day. They lot. I remember I saw them in the morning and then Trish tried to see them in the afternoon. They'd gone a long way, but eventually came back out again. So it's quite strange that they moved around, but so nice to see them. And that Mangan male looks so much better, doesn't he? His mane looks good. Everything about him looks like a sort of healthy young boy these days, which is wonderful. If you kind of go back from where he was to now, it's absolutely amazing how much that lion has recovered. Many wrote him off, and it just goes to show you just how resilient lions are. Look, David, the elephants are closer, but it's darker, which means that we're not going to see much, are we? But we can at least get somewhat of a view. It's pretty, at least. And it will allow us to sit quietly in the hope that our lions will roar. Ian, what is the longest time a lion can roar for? Now, Ian, before I answer that, just give me two seconds. <coughs> Today I decided to start exercising, and I think my lungs are about to come out of my, my chest. Um, it's been a while, so I'm suffering a little bit. But anyway, um, Ian, the longest uh, lion can roar is certainly longer than I can hold my breath right now. Um, it's, I suppose not that long, though. Um, some lions will kind of go and... Generally, I find it's about 30 seconds, 30 to 40 seconds is my kind of average count. If I go look at all the videos I've ever taken of lions roaring, generally around that area for a individual lion. Um, obviously, prides, they roar at different times and it can go longer. Um, but generally, between 30 and 40 seconds is my personal observation. I might could be completely off in terms of other lions. Um, it also might be other lions that have gone over a minute. Who knows? But generally, it's not that long. Generally, it's a sort of warm-up, and then it's this crescendo, and then that slow kind of um, decrease in sound that leads to it kind of fading out. And then that process, like I say, is normally about 30 seconds. Um, but isn't that cool to see eddies around water? I mean, it's been so long since I've seen an eddy herd nice and close. I, I'm actually very sad about it. I love spending time with elephants, and particularly eddies, when there's lots of little babies and when they're all around us. And it really, really kind of is a happy place to be when you've got elephants around you. And it's sad in a way that we, we don't have much water this year, which means that our eddy sightings aren't going to be the best. But in another way, it's pretty good because in summer, hopefully what we're going to see is a lot of those eddies pushing back into the area and, and we're going to see nice big herds coming through so that's my hope um but it's always nice look at the little baby running <laughs> with its ears out chasing franklins and guinea fowl and various other things naughty little one they're very cool to watch though but they're unfortunately heading the wrong way they're heading back into manuleti look at it running along <laughs> it's going to go greet the rest any you say is so cute it is very, very cute. Little baby elephants are some of the cutest creatures. They've got so much attitude and so much about them that makes them very fun to watch. And I always love seeing them, especially when they get a little bit of the kind of crazies and they charge around all over the place and push and shove and hit trees and ears are out and birds get chased and it's just complete chaos. It's like they become, you know, when kids have had too much Coca-Cola or something like that and they just go crazy. It's That's how these little baby elephants go. And then the trunk is all over the place. I always thoroughly enjoy watching them when they get that. And so nice to see that little one charging about. The rest of the herd, of course, is far calmer and is just taking it very easy. I'm sure they're loving the fact that there's some pumped water there. So they would have drank that right out of where it's coming from. And then as they kind of finish up with that water, so they'll start to push back over the hill and into the Manuleti to go and feed. Right, I'm going to sit here for a while longer because I want to hear if I can hear those lines roar again. In the meantime, though, while our Ellie's play with water, let's send you back across to Lauren, who has now left Chitwa Dam. The sound of a lion's roar just vibrates right through me. I remember when I first arrived at Juma, the Incahomas were doing that really deep contact calling. I think they were on quarantine but it sounded like they were outside my door. And I remember thinking, the lions are outside my door. It was terrifying. Of course they weren't outside my door, but that sound is very difficult to di differentiate how far away it is and where it's coming from. And that's the one thing about the dam cam. The dam cam is an amazing piece of technology, but we hear things and they sound closer than they actually are. And of course, leopards sawing will, all, just like Tristan said, lions only roar for about 30 seconds. 
leopards are the same. They can't continuously saw for minutes after minutes. It's normally short bursts of sawing. And of course, with leopards, it's very raspy. And who is the king of sawing? It is, of course, Tinga, who we saw this week a lot. So let's take a look at him sawing. Although a definite presence, both in size and stature, one can't help but see a slight glimmer of Tlalamba's mischievousness on the aging Duke's face. However, unlike his daughter, Tingana is rarely shy. Especially while on evening patrol, the Duke ensures that all those around are aware of his territory in an oddly welcoming way. Undeterred by the influx of uninvited visitors and yet proving to be quite the host. Oh, Tingana, how I love you. I really do love that leopard. Now we're about to go through a tricky signal patch, which is why we've stopped. So before we go any further, we're gonna send you back to the tent with Trishala. Now, I've decided to do this dissection just a little bit quickly because the light is dropping, but it's okay. We will quickly have a look here. So we're going to be chatting about bird vision and just exactly how birds see the world. Now, birds are tetrachromatic, which means they have four types of cone cells that are able to detect even ultraviolet light. Now, what we have here is a chicken's eye. Now, I told you before that chickens are able to regenerate that lens of theirs. We're going to cut it open. In a similar way, it's generally safer to use your scissors if you don't have a nice surface in which to lean against with your scalpel. So we'll cut it clean in half and we'll have a look at the differences in here. So there we have, totally in half. Oh, this is very nice because this is a fresh one. So, you can see really clearly that lens there. Looks like a Mentos. And then you have the vitreous humor, all that goo. Let's get some of that goo out so we can have a good look. Leave goo. Right, so that's really nice and clean. I'm very happy with that. You have that nice ciliary body around and that really cool lens in the middle much better than our last lens we had and on this side here we have the retina and you can so clearly see the white retina there now birds also have a very special contraption called the pectin ocelli and what it does I think that might be it there is it provides blood and other resources, so basically blood and gas exchange for the eye. Because what ends up happening is that the, oh, sorry, jean I just felt like kneeling there. Are you okay with this? <laughs> so what actually happens is that because, so when a bird flies through a canopy and they want to hunt and they see a rat on the ground and they're already flying in the canopy, the level of light or the um, different angles of light that are coming into their eye changes. And so that can actually make you totally disoriented and also causes you to have a shadow. So it causes you to see a shadow of the blood vessels that are in your retina, which is not helpful if you want to catch something that's this big when you are this big. So what they have is this pectin and what it does, it compacts all those blood vessels. So that's the blood supply and it doesn't have that shadowy blood vessel look on the eye that you would if you and I had to see light constantly from different angles. So that's what's really useful for them. And we can just tear away slowly the actual retina, which is basically this, this white stuff there. Can you see that? That I'm taking off. That there is the retina. So with this eye here, let's just have a quick look here. We saw that the retina, which was this bit, was actually on top of the black bit. But here, it is not. 
And that's because this black bit in a mammal's eye is where all the blood vessels are kept and the gas exchange happens. But here, it's just isolated to that one spot. So you can easily take retina. Let's use both hands to show it. There you go. can completely come out. And that pectin... Oh, I'm sorry about that, guys. But I have a pectin for you. Hope you like it. Just there which is quite nice. Now, the optic nerve should come out here, or somewhere around here. Just as soon as I find, oh, there we go. So here is the optic nerve, and that should be where its blind spot is, and where we can't really take off this black, which is exactly rare, exactly there. All right, so, we know that birds need to be able to see well and not have blood vessels in their way. I just want to, I, I love a good lens, eh? Let's just have a quick look at this lens because it looks very, very nice. Now you can see that it's quite flattened and that is quite common with birds. Whereas with humans, you'll see that it's quite, quite round. And here it's quite flattened. A good look at our ciliary bodies again and the iris. Very, very cool. Now I said to you that they are tetrachromatic. Actually, before we get into this, there, I explained to you that there are two chambers in the eye. One that's in front of the lens and one that is behind the lens. So the one behind the lens, we know that it's getting oxygen from the blood vessels, right? So where is the oxygen coming for your cornea? It breathes on its own, which I think is amazing. So what it ends up doing is because there's no blood vessels there, because if there were blood vessels, all we'd see are blood vessels floating around as we're watching something like Safari Live and you wouldn't want that. So what it does is it, the layer of liquid on the eye actually has a gas exchange relationship, we'll see, but gas exchange happens between that and the tears so that the liquid in the eye can draw in oxygen from the oxygen in the tears. Amazing, your eyes breathe on its own. Think about that, that's amazing. All right, let's go in and we can watch a vulture clip quickly and have a look at exactly, I think we can take these off now. And we can see, or sort of have a look at their eye when it's not being cut up by Trishala. Okay. Oh no, no, stop vulture. Let's start you from the beginning. Okay, so we've got our lovely white backed vultures here. And you can see that huge eye. It really is a big eye. And it's not just a big eye. It's dilated. It's collecting as much light as it can. And even more so, remember we were speaking about fovea? Birds have two fovea. So essentially they have a zoom lens and a macro lens in each eye. So it can zoom, one eye can look out all the way to camp and be like, oh, okay, I can see them at camp. And then the other eye can be looking right down at the ground or their feet. And they have equal kind of vision when that happens. They have equal, Oh, I love at the end when the hyenas come in. If you come in yet, hyenas. And so what it does is means that you can focus on two things at the same time and you can judge distance and then also zone in on something and grab it. And like I said, they do see UV light and a lot of the times birds' feathers can reflect UV lights. So that makes sense. Animals generally don't possess something that is of no use to them. So we can't, okay, some people, or apparently we can extend into the UV range as well. And some people, especially women, have been recorded to be tetrachromatic, just like bugs can be, so they can see that extra cone in birds like we spoke about. But it is really unique because birds can have that UV signature on feathers, and that means that it would be meaningful if somebody could actually see that in UV life because if they're not if they can't see it then why on earth would you invest in that kind of adaptation so that's really really cool about birds so we've learned that they have these two fovea in each eye essentially two kind of 
ways to receive information. And then we've also learned about their pectin and the fact that they have these blood vessels that are there and of course that they can see in four different wavelengths, tetrachromatic. Exciting stuff, always excites me. And then plus, I get to spend some time with some eyes. Who wouldn't like that? Anyway, I'd send you to Lauren now. I wonder if she has any eyes to show you besides her own. I am in IR and it's tricky for my eyes to see now. This is the light where humans really don't see well at all. That sort of transition between day and night. Now, chameleons, believe it or not, are not the only mm. animals to have this independent <coughs> 360 um, I just need tech to come eye. through so we can uh, are, shift to the mic. There's many animals in the ocean that have it too. And this includes your flounders, which are bizarre fish whose eyes actually take a migration. So they start off normal, if you imagine a sort of normal fish eyes. And one eye, it depends, it's not always the left or the right, it can change between each, each individual, will actually migrate to the other side of the face. And these eyes can rotate 360 independently from one another so it's not just chameleons that have that feature and just like Trishala was saying it's fascinating how can one brain understand images from two different eyes so one eye is on your breakfast and the other eye is on the television what kind of signals are going into your brain and that is what baffles me that's a very high level of perception right there and of course talking of the ocean it's not just land animals that have incredible eyes. One of the most complex eyes in the entire animal kingdom is the mantis shrimp. And that's obviously an oceanic animal. And they're said to have 12 photoreceptors. Humans and other animals are said to have three, which get excited by the hues of red, blue, and green. Now, this allows us as humans to see a full color spectrum so what on earth does 12 photoreceptors allow you to see? So there was a recent study because we assumed, well, naturally, that mantis shrimps can see a whole other rainbow, a kaleidoscope of technicolor, because of course they have 12 photoreceptors, but a study has actually proved that they don't. They're very limited in their color vision. And they used all sorts of tests with different wavelengths of light and different foods. And that's how they were able to analyze their vision. And they don't see that well. They don't see a broad color spectrum. So the question still remains on many people's lips. Why do they need such eyes? Why do they need to have such complex, amazing eyes whose have 12 photoreceptors and it's not fully understood yet in science so they now know that they don't see that many colors but it's not understood why yes emma maybe they can see into the future now that is a theory i would love to protect they're incredible animals full stop but these eyes just not fully understood why they need them Debbie's asking why do predators often eat eyes first? Now, not all predators do this, but I know that lots of birds definitely do this. And if you imagine a dead impala, let's say, for example, it's not a very pleasant thought, and the eyes are obviously open and it's a fresh death, the eyes are actually the softest part for the animal to eat and I'm sure very delicious. I know that when I spent a lot of time in Maldives, they eat a lot of fish over there. It's the main part of their diet, especially tuna, and they, they eat the eyes. They absolutely love it. So I imagine it will have a high nutrition content, but it's also the softest and most accessible part when you have a carcass. Not all birds can come in, we're just using birds as an example, and open a carcass. Yes, your lappet faced vulture definitely can, but if you think about it, some birds have to wait until the carcass is open before they can feed. Now, of course, your mammals are a little bit different. They can open a carcass straight away, but the eyes are soft, juicy, and I imagine quite high in nutrition. But great question, Debbie, very impressive. And it's obviously not a very nice thought, especially when you come across a dead animal whose eyes are gone, but nothing else is missing. 
So I've not had much luck so far, but I'm not giving up. So while we bumble forward, we're going to send you across to Tristan. Scared for you of Altaino. Yes, you are with me again. Unfortunately, no, we haven't found our male lions. David, we are failing. Oh my goodness. Right, let's try and tackle this slope without damaging everything. So what we're gonna do now is check Gallego Pan because the last track I had was heading towards Gallego Shortcut. So maybe at this time of the day, if they're still here, then maybe they're having a drink. The only thing that surprises me is that, I mean, if, if there was other lions roaring, I would have expected them to have responded. Um, I wouldn't have expected them to have been quiet and they didn't seem to respond from any sort of direction this way. But I do know that two of the evokers were seen this morning on Samambili crossing into Juma towards Sydney's dam. Uh, what have we got there, David? This looks like a little diker, I think, maybe. Is it? It's just dropped its head. You see it there in the background. So underneath that quarry, but to the back. Yeah, yeah. sorry, Dev. It's a diker, so I don't want to blind it. Sorry, but <laughs> I thought it for a second it might be something else, but then the way it dropped its head was... I am testing your eyes, Emma. It's good to test one's eyes. I hope you've been eating your carrots so that your eyes are good. It's good for you to eat carrots for your eyes, apparently. That's what my tracker always used to tell me, is that he sees well because he eats his carrots. Of course, there's no... Gingers can't eat carrots, it's too much orange. This is what Emma has just said in my ear. You see, everyone thinks we make fun of the ginger um, crew members, but it's not us, they make fun of themselves. Um, so, uh, fair enough, Emma. Hashtag true fact. Okay, fair enough. I've got no argument, so there's nothing more that I can say. You, you've caught me off guard here, Emma. Um, but, okay, no carrots for the gingers then. In camp, no carrots for Kirsty and no carrots for Emma. Do we have any others, David? I so. I'm also quite surprised that none of our presenters or guys within camp, camp ops um, who grow beards have got a ginger beard because there's always one that doesn't have ginger hair, but when they grow their beard, it's ginger. Vildes was a little bit, but it wasn't much, David. You know, there's some guys that get that red beard, eh? that proper, what we call in Afrikaans a roibart. Yeah, there's those guys. Um, but we don't have one of those in camp, which surprises me because it's a common thing to see is normally guys are like, oh, I'm just gonna grow a beard and they have brown hair. And then all of a sudden this bright orange red beard comes out and you think to yourself, where has that come from? Um, but it happens. Luckily, I'm so glad I don't have a red beard, David. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a beard. I actually shaved my beard today, David. I trimmed my beard today. Very good. Exactly. So, feel much better about life. Although, you know, it's funny. I haven't actually shaved my beard off completely since... When was the, first, when the last time I actually shaved my beard off completely? 2010 was the last time I had a completely clean shaven face which which is a long time ago it's <laughs> a very very long time ago anyway I don't know how we got into this conversation I wonder if the Mangan males and the Nkuma males are so happy now that they don't have to worry about their face being shaved by little mites or particularly the Mangan male he's probably loving the fact that he can grow his beard in his rebellious phase <laughs> now Apparently I'm not keeping it character based at all, which I haven't, I must be honest. And so I'm going to send you over to Trish so we can actually talk about eyes and not red beards. Well, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to grow a beard here under the microscope, Tristan, but there you have it. So we have two interesting critters here on the microscope. We have the dragonfly, which is of course the huge one with two eyes and a big yellow area in the front. And then we have that little spider at the end. And that's because we're going to chat a bit about both of them. Now, I'd like you to stay on that microscope so I can point some things out to you. In fact, ah, I got my quill. It's OK. I'll point with my quill. Now, let us start with this dragonfly here. This dragonfly right there. Let's move you across. There you go. And see if we can get you just a better resolution. Oh. 
there's there we go so you the two brown halves that you are looking at are the compound eyes and most invertebrates have this compound eye and basically that means that they have thousands of facets that are all taking information about light and sensing it so these facets are called omatidia and dragonflies have about 30,000 of these tiny lenses per eye so it's getting information about all around it and then also remember that these are quite dome shaped and they almost take the whole space of the head so it gives them a perfect view of everything around them they are truly truly inspiring dragonflies have about the best hunting capability and the best vision amongst insects and hunting capability even amongst all animals very very good surprisingly 100 percent hunting rate guess who hashtag safari live let me know 100 percent they catch 100 percent of the things that they chase Anyway, let me not distract you. I can even give you the answer in a bit, but we'll, let's go do this for now. So each one of these omatidia are these compound sort of lenses and they stitch this image together. So you know sometimes you see in cartoons when you look through um, a bee's eyes or something and you see all these composite images, that is, that can happen. That is what this allows to do. But depending on the way that the, that the information is taken by the in light information is taken and is then sort of manipulated and converted in the brain you can either get a whole lot of these big images that are stitched together or you can even get sort of a one big pixelated blur either way something like a fly doesn't really care if what's coming towards them is a newspaper or a hand or a tongue or a mouth it doesn't matter it just means that something's coming go so they don't actually need to have very defined vision just very sort of aware vision, if that makes sense. So let's go back here. Now we've seen our compound eyes. We know that they have very, very many compound eyes. But what's also important, now Lauren talked to you about the mantis shrimp and having those 12 different opsins or color receptors in their eyes. Well, dragonflies have 11 different opsins. So they also have quite a good view. But like Lauren said, which is very true, just because they have these high amount of options doesn't mean that they see hundreds and millions and thousands of colors. In fact, as a human, that's, tetra uh, that's um, trichromatic, we see about a million colors. And somebody who is tetrachromatic would probably see close to 10 million colors, which is amazing in my opinion. And the options are related to that, but not exclusively. So just because it has 11 options doesn't mean that it's going to have, like Lawrence said, this kaleidoscope um, that's going on with them. So we said that we had those two compound eyes, which is basically the, apart from a simple eye, really old form of an eye. And then we have, and you're going to have to look carefully because they're quite small. I'm going to point them out. So each one of those facets, there comes my thing are located there as those little dots hexagonal dots and then over here you got one two and three and those are three simple eyes now these simple eyes are only detecting for light so it's giving the the dragonfly an idea of oh you're going down because the light's going down and that light center is picking it up Oh, you're going too high because all of a sudden there's a whole heap of light. So it's really, really good for them in flight. It makes a lot of sense. And they also have a similar type of thing where they can kind of keep the horizontal in line with their flight in the same way as you would if you were a pilot and you need to keep the plane in on that sort of plane in that little disc there where it has the actual plane doing this. And you've got to keep it in line. And that's what the dragonflies kind of have in their eye as well. So they can see always see the horizon and always meet the horizon now each one of these ocelli actually have they're very simple they have a little kind of bulge at the top and then they collect light and they bring it down to the sensory organ and that's a basic eye part to collect the light and a part to process the light now these other three that are there like i said very simple many other insects have them too but it offers them basically 30,000 60,000 60,003 eyes. Yes. Anyway, on to the next one. Let's have a look at our spidey here. Which you can't see much of at all. Let's see if we can adjust it.
There we go. So now spiders do have many eyes and you would know that spiders have simple eyes and these simple eyes are sort of positioned in various ways. They have these big ones at the front and those is what they use to kind of see around normally in front of them. And then at the ends, at the edges, they also have eyes, simple eyes that can de detect UV light and they are also tetrachromatic. So lots of things going on there. Anyway, let me send you over to Lauren because there's so much I want to get out and we simply don't have enough time. So let's go over to Lauren and she can chat to you a little bit about our lovely Tandy. Oh, beautiful Trishala is full of information. Talking about spiders, my favorite animal. So it appears the animals are all being very elusive tonight, I'm afraid. I was hoping to bump into somebody, but even the lepers have been very elusive. Tungana's probably resting after his TV performance. Now, talking of being elusive, who is the most elusive of all? And it is, of course, the Queen of Juma, and that is Queen with a K. And I was lucky enough to bump into Tandy twice this week. So let's go and take a look at what happened. We see all sorts of tales out and about on safari spotting the flickering of a white tip through the long grass is a telltale sign that manages to excite most especially when it is attached to the queen of juma which has the tendency to twitch in all directions when there is the possibility of prey close by however standing to attention and calling tandy out before she had the opportunity to pounce, the Simpala left the queen with her tail metaphorically between her legs and in need of another plan for lunch. And just like that, Tandy disappeared, as she always does. She knows her size. She's very small and petite, especially against the likes of the male leopard. And of course, she can just slip away from our clutches. But I'm glad I got to see her, not once, but twice. So we're gonna casually head on back to the quarantine area to see if anything is happening around there. And of course, Trishala is not finished just yet. So let's go back to her. video. Hello everyone, I just figured out a small problem, but hopefully we will... <laughs> Shandri, how do we work this out? Okay, so we are on the microscope feed and we're stuck there at this point because <laughs> I wanted to play you and... Uh... Oh, okay, cool. <gasps> Yay, okay, so FC has a chameleon and they can play it and then I will talk about it. Thank goodness, because this footage is just magnificent. So let's go ahead and play that chameleon clip and then I can chat to you about it while it plays. <laughs> okay, so you can see that chameleon eyes do move independently and they do this, of course, because they need to get a really good view of everything that's happening around them. And there's actually a point where this comedian looks back right at the, the, pers at the camera, which is really awesome. How amazing was, were those shots? It was amazing, right? How could I not have played that? But you get right at the end there, it looks back. And because it, it's able to. Now, if you can see that it's got those small pinhole pupils, but that pinhole pupil actually is the eyelids that have fused over and just left that space for the pupil to look through. Really interesting things. Now, the other interesting thing is that it has two types of lenses in it. Oh, well, two types of light focusing apparatus in it. One is a positive um, cornea, so it's convex, not concave, like a cave, and Oh wow, we've gone through this really quickly. But anyway, the light, it gets it gets to get in light and use different ways of apparatus to actually focus light and bring things into focus. So you can look at one image with this eye and then the other image, other eye can sort of just bring it in and then it's suddenly got a binocular vision and it can suddenly have depth of field because we know that eyes on the side don't allow that very well. Whew. 
Thank goodness I got that chameleon information out there because I was not happy that I didn't. But now I have a little bit more time to tell you about the lens that they have, which is actually, so our lens, you saw it was round like this. A chameleon's lens is like this. So it's thin at the, in, the, in the middle and then broad on the outside. And apparently it means that they can have better sort of acuity in their eyes. Which I think that's pretty cool. It can be diff very difficult to be able to tell that sort of thing. But hey, if I find a dead chameleon, we can have a look as always. If I find a dead anything, we can always have a look. In fact, you can even send requests if you want. <laughs> But I hope that you've had a really wonderful safari lives with us because I do enjoy it. It's one of my favorite days of the week when we have our safari lives. We've learned so much about all our characters. And of course, we got to touch on the wonderful world of eyes and vision. So now we can see how animals see. So thank you for your questions and your comments. We'll see you in the morning for Sunrise Safari.